I see there are more people going. All right, cool. And then Rain Cross, can you hear me? Okay, nice. I am uh, not gonna do, I'm not going to wear the mic today because uh, people from Zoom hear the echo. So I'll just like uh, speak directly. If you cannot hear me, please, please just let me know. Okay, so uh, guys, welcome back. And uh, this lecture is gonna be the last lecture that we talk about software security. And also this is gonna be the last teaching lecture in this semester. So starting from the next week, we are going to have uh, one more class that talk about the final CTF. So if you care about your finals, do you know join the class? We will talk about that. Um, so uh, announcement number one, you may already notice the assignment uh, for software security has been just released. So in this assignment, you will have eight tasks. It's still in the uh, you know, palm.6e365.io. Um, Let me just uh, walk you through real quick. So you should be able to see the challenges here. So it's the last component cost back overflow. And there are eight challenges there. I already see softs, that's great. So the tasks here for you is to, you know, solve those challenges um, using the techniques that we talk about uh, for overflow, especially from last lecture. Um, you will see that for level one and three and five, there are, I think it's also seven, there are source code available. So you can check the source code, analyze it, and then find the vulnerability and uh, use Stack Overflow, you know, exploits to get the flag. For level two, four, and six, you're not going to be given the source code. So you need to disassemble it or decompile it. So you need to reverse engineer the program and then read it and then figure out where the vulnerability is and then attack. So this is not the final. This is another assignment. Um, so for those levels, each one, each level counts for 15 points. So the total of this assignment is still a hundred, but you will have a chance to get 120. Uh, if you solve seven challenges, you will get 105. And if you solve all the challenges, you will get 120. And I want to note too that the last challenge, level eight, contains knowledge that are beyond our lecture. So in order to get this extra credit, you need to learn stuff by yourself. And especially that's called like Rob or return to Lipsy. So you need to learn this technique by yourself in order to achieve level eight. But even though that you don't want to learn about yourself and you only want to, you know, just do those challenges that cover, that all covered in our class, you will still be able to finish the first seven challenges and get five more credits. Because again, the total is a hundred and each challenge accounts for 15. So you will be able to get like 105 if you solve seven challenges. Okay, so um, any questions? No? Great. Uh, did someone ask a question? No? Okay. Oh, and so this is announcement number one. Assignment five is released. And number two is next class, we are going to talk about the uh, setup of the vinyl CTF. Um, so, uh, I highly encourage you to attend since this is going to be something that is very relevant to your final, very relevant to your score. All right. And another announcement is that we will have our final, uh, 
sometime next week. Probably going to be the middle of next week. Uh, but this is just like an approximation. I will be, but it will be next week. It will start from next week. Um, the final CTF will be about one week. Uh, we haven't decided the exact length, but now we're expecting to have one week or 10 days for youth. So just be tuned, stay tuned for that. Uh, and we will, of course, send an announcement when the final CTF starts. So consider this as a you know, take home exam. You can search online, you can Google it. But of course, you don't want to Google the result. And also, you don't want to work on this with all you know, your, your friends. All right. <coughs> so I guess there's no more questions regarding those logistics. And if you're good, we are going to continue to talk about stack defense today. OK. So, you know, last time we talked about the book workflow and we, wait, we work on challenges together. We work on a specific challenge that, uh, you know, we read the source code, we identify the buffer overflow vulnerability, right? So we overflow the buffer and then we try to overflow the saved return address, right? We overwrite, sorry, we overwrite the saved return, of, re, saved RAP, saved return address. And then we overwrite that to a value that can either just execute, you know, like a wing function, like, you know, a function that will achieve our goal, or actually we can rewrite that to, you know, the stack where we put the shell code there. And shell code means you know, a bunch of instructions that you could, you know, uh, execute arbitrarily. Okay. And then, you know, by the time that the function returns, by the time that the buffer full of vulnerability is triggered, um, you know, the time that function returns, the, the program will execute the address where, you know, the uh, <coughs> stack stores, which is the overwritten wing function or the shortcode that are saved in the buffer. So this is the way that we can use Stack Overflow to control the program, to let the program execute whatever we want them to execute, right? So question here is that, how are we gonna defend against it? How schools, sorry, how systems manage to, you know, have uh, ways to defend against attacks like such? And can we stop those exploitation? And here comes some existing mechanisms that have been implemented into Linux operating systems that help to mitigate the stack overflow vulnerability. So the first is called stack canary. What stack canary tries to do is that it will insert a random value on the stack between the saved you know, RBP and the local argument. So this is so-called canary. It is a randomized value um, that, uh, you know, the attacker or the users are not supposed to know. And having those value will help us in the way that whenever there is an overwritten happen, because, you know, the overwrite, the overwritten operation uh, well, you know, overwrite the saved RP address, and in order to reach the saved RP address, it has to overflow a local argument. So it will inevitably, you know, touch the canary part. And because user doesn't know about the value of the canary, it will change the value of canary by the time that overflows the local argument. <coughs> and because of that, splitting system can just check you know, if the canary's value got changed every time that a function returns, like before, right before function returns. And this is exactly how Linux works. If you just compile, you know, Linux GCC and then look at the, you know, the functions. If you disassemble a function, you will be able to see some instructions similar to this where I just had it. So it's like, you know, you move some value to Rx and then you move the value to you know, like this is RBP minus eight, right? So you move that randomized value onto the places that are 
between the local arguments and the saved RBP and RID. And this is the start of a function. Um, and similarly, by the time that the function is about to return, it's gonna you know, extract those value out and then compare this value with this another places that stores the default value, which is FS40. So that is a specific stack location actually, stores the global, you know, randomize the value. And there's no way, well, I, I, I shouldn't say no way, but like, it's gonna be very hard for attackers to touch that place and overwrite that value or change that value. So it will extract this low post canary out and compare that value with the global canary value. And that's why there's an XOR there. So doing the XOR, will you know compare the value and you know that if there are two values that are equal and if you XOR them together you will get zero right and this is exactly the way that they you know use you know XOR to trigger this zero flag to be set to zero or one and they use an conditional jump jump equal to somewhere to some well uh, to somewhere that are you know can be executed and can be like returned normally Otherwise, it will just call stack check fail. Okay, makes sense. Can you understand those code? Good. Awesome. Yeah, so, you know, if you are going to exploit uh, a program, of course, you want to check if the canary exists. And if the canary exists, then you need to come up with a way to bypass that. Otherwise, you can just ignore it and, it, and just continue to do your stack uh, overflow. And also the canary will affect you in terms of offsets because now canary will be inserted between the local arguments and the saved RBP. And that means that, you know, um, if you look at the local arguments offsets, then everything will be shifted by eight because original RBPs, this area will be needed to, you know, reserved to store the canary's value. But of course, if you have a way that you can identify the start address of the arguments that you want to overflow, and there is a way for you to know like the RBP's value, you can ignore category because category will be included when you calculate the offset. All right. So more information about category. As I just said, category is a random value predefined for thread before main is called. Um, it is an eight byte. You know, value randomized for x six sixty four and for x six, um, it's thirty two bits. So that is four bytes. Um, and the value stored on stack. And in fact, you you can you know check this value. You can take a look at this address that stores this particular random value. And if you just use that info ox v in the back, which is a plugin of uh, GDB, you will be able to get this specific field that tells you that, hey, this is the location that stores the randomized stack value. You can also, you know, by the time that uh, you run the program, you know, when you run the program, you will know the process ID of this program. And then you can access this <coughs> value using this command, od db 8 and then check the uh, process details, and then you can like in Linux or say, yeah, I would say in Linux, uh, it's gonna be like the pro processes information is the ender slash proc slash the number of the process, and then you'll be able to get this information, the stack carrier's information. All right. Um, so what more thing about stack canary is that you know the last byte of the canary it's going to be always equal to zero. Um, and there is a reason for that. Uh, take this as like a, a brain teaser. Just like, can you think about why the stack canary's last device has to be set to hex zero? No, yeah. So the reason for this is because it wants to stop 
for example, suppose that above secondary, there is a string argument. Okay, so like there is a string argument. That means that, you know, if the argument, if the string is say, in length of 10 bytes, that you can just, you know, move or put 10 bytes values over there. And if, you know, it happens <coughs> that this 10 bytes doesn't end property. If this 10 bytes doesn't have like, you know, uh, tax zero zero at the end of the string, then if you print the string, you will be accidentally also print the stack counter value, right? Because, you know, there's no hex zero over there. And if you just print the string, we'll just print all the way down to the place that has a byte zero. And that's why stack canary wants to put the hex zero zero by the end of it. So that if someone just have a local variable above stack canary, and that is a string, and if someone gonna print the string, it's not gonna print out the value automatically for stack header. So in that case, there's no way for a normal operation, you know, to leak the stack header value. And this is the only reason why the last byte of the canary has been set to zero zero, just like you know, a, a, a guaranteed stop for uh, local arguments. Okay. So now we know about how this defense possibly work, right? So it inserts a random value and whenever someone maliciously overwrite an overflow, you know, overflow an argument, a local argument and the overwrite stack canary, it will trigger, right? Because by the time before they return, so we'll check this value again. So the question <coughs> is, how can we bypass the stack canary? Um, there is like no guaranteed solution. There are multiple different like ways, and some of them it may work, may not work, uh, for a program. It depends. But you need to know that okay, those are the possible solutions, so, so that you can use them and you can try them. You know, for for your exploit. So the first way is to see okay, if there's a way for us to lead the counter value, right? We just said that. Canary values less by has been set to zero because it wants to stop from leaking, right? But still, is there a way for us to leak the canary value? And then the second is to overwrite the predefined canary stored in stack. And then the third one is a hijack this function. Okay, let's start with leak the canary value. As I just said, the last the bytes of the stack canary is zero, zero. And the reason why this says that is because, you know, if someone like the local argument doesn't end with zero, zero, and if someone just like print the local arguments, it will start to print canary. And that is exactly something that we want to, um, you know, take advantage if we have a stack overflow. Because if we have a stack overflow, we can change this last byte of stack canary. We can change that to something that is not zero. And then we can print the local variable. And because, you know, the local variable will be, you know, directly connected to the stack canary without any zero, zero cutting in the middle, the print will just continue to print all the bytes, including stack canary. So for example, here, if we have a vulnerable function, okay? So if we have a vulnerable function and then we just, you know, have a buffer over there can be overflow, then we can use that to overwrite the last byte of the stack canary. And then by the time that the buffer will be print out, it will print out this entire buffer because there's no stop for that. Um, so the second approach is to, you know, you want to overwrite the stack canary to whatever value. But then you know that it will be different from the original stack canary value that you have already set over there. And the lucky thing is that the predefined calendar <coughs> value is also stored on stack. And this is just like all the way, you know, um, down. I mean, like all the way in the higher address. It's in the higher address of the stack. So that means that if you can overflow the larger local arguments and then you can overflow it for a very, very long bytes that you can not only just change the value of the local stack canary, but also you can change that predefined stack canary's value all the way 
um, you know, to the higher address of the stack. So if you manage to stack, to change both value, and then you change this to value, you know, to be equal, then even though that later on the stack handler's check is going to be triggered, it will compare these two locations, you know, value, and it will still consider it's equal. And of course it's equal because you set this, and you set them to be equal, right? So in this case, you don't have to know the original stack handler's value. You just overwrite them all. I don't care if the value is like whatever kind of random bytes, but I would just set them all the way to the same value, like AAA or that B for something that you like, you know, like some magic value, you set them equal. And in that case, you will be able to bypass the stack handler check. And then another way, the third way to bypass is to change stack check fail. So that means that, okay, yes, we cannot do the stack henry, you know, correct. We will still overwrite the value and the check will be triggered and the system knows that the check is failed. However, if we manage to, you know, change the function of stack check fail, you know, we check that function to something that we're interested in, or maybe that wing function. We change that to wing function. That means that by the time that stack canary, you know, tag has failed, it will actually call the, you know, the, the wing function instead of the actual checking fail function, which will trigger, you know, the accent or the false, you know, uh, alarm that, uh, you know, uh, you know, alert the, the system or quit this with, with error. So in that way that you will be able to also bypass the stack category. Um, you could do that by changing the PL to a dot PL to table. Uh, if you uh, take a look at this particular instruction, you see that, one second, here we go. So here is the, you know, the instruction. And the last instruction says it's called stack check fail. And this is at the PL to table. Um, Due to the limit of time, I don't have to, I, I can't just give you, you know, too much details about the TIPLT table, uh, but on the high level, PLT is a table uh, that can help you to jump to, you know, the true implementation of this, um, um, this function. You can consider PLT as like a trampoline, you know, it just helps you to jump to the right place. Um, but, and you can change this PLT, you know, the God's table, which is the table that stores the actual, you know, address of this function, uh, of this function. All right, so um, that's, you know, one well, way that we can bypass, well, I mean, those are the ways that we can bypass stack canary. And I guess that, that you know, stack canary, it's, it checks the overwritten value by the time that the function returns. So it kind of stops you or stops an attack at the point that it overwrites the save the return address, right? So you can you can still overwrite the return address, but then by the time that the return wants to you know return, by the time that the current the complete function finishes, it will no longer really you know, return to the address that you expect because there is a sanity check, there is a stack canary that checks, you know, the value. But as we just say, there's no way, I mean, there are ways that you can bypass. So if you bypass the stack canary, what can you do as a defender? What can the operating system do to still, you know, try to stop this attack if stack canary fails? So the next defense mechanism happens, you know, uh, or uh, like mitigates the issues that, you know, uh, the RIP points to the shell code, uh, stops the, you know, the return the value that be overwritten to the right value. So it's like the PI or the, the, the defense mechanism is called PI or ASLR. So those defense is gonna stop you from writing the correct value to the save the RIP. So it will disturb you and let you not be able to identify what exactly is the correct address of like the wing function. And the way that it works is that uh, PIE is short for position independent executable. So um, it's 
stop to tell you where exactly the win function is. And in fact, every time that you execute the program, you will probably see a different location of your win function. So if you compare, you know, this to, you know, um, um, like man's output, the first one is the function that, uh, the first one is the program without PIE in middle. And then the second program is with, is with PIE in middle. And you will be able to see that if you just use opjump dash T to get the, you know, the value, like the address of this function V, the first one will give you, you know, a legitimate, the like code second dot se uh, text section uh, address, which is something that you already seen from last time's lecture, right? So you get the function's address, and then you know that okay, this is address that we function will 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 exist, will stores, and you just override your return value with this particular address. However, if you look at the second program, what you see here is not a valid. Uh, you know, function address. And in fact, that's just the offset of this particular, you know, this particular function um, offset to the entire um, program. And in fact, every time that this function is loaded into memory, it's about to execute, or we load it into an arbitrary randomized place. So in that case, we only know the offset of the function, but we will not be able to get the complete, you know, the like the absolute address, the complete address of the function. In this case, if you're gonna overwrite, you know, the return IP, you don't know where you're gonna overwrite. I mean, you, you don't know what value that you want to overwrite. Um, and there's still a way to bypass PIE, it turns out that. Um, and the way is that, um, although that those functions by the time that it's loaded into the memory will be in you know randomized address, the offset or say the difference, you know, the distance between those functions are not going to be changed. Um, for example, if you see there are two functions here, you know, a main function main and a function we, and if you check these two functions, you will see that you know this is the the left hand part, the left hand side part is the you know runtime address of those functions. You GDB it and you see that like those are some random bytes that there's no way for us to get it. You know, we just don't know where those are coming from. We cannot predict it by the time that we execute it. However, the low the lower part of the address is somehow predictable because the offset is always the always fixed. And the way that the operating system works is that whenever it initiates, you know, the program initiates the process, it will use like a page to store those code information. And the base address of the page will be changed, will be changed all the time. However, by the time that the entire code chunk, you know, moves or copies into this page, the way, the layout of those functions are not gonna be changed. And that means that the offset or the difference between those functions, which are loaded into the same page, will not be changed. And that's why if you use GDB, if you access the program and then you check those functions like main and a we, you see that the difference between these two functions are, you know, like 538 minus 310. And if you also look at these two functions statically, even though the program has PIE, PI enabled, you will still be able to get the offset and then calculate the difference of the offset. And similarly, say if you are exploit a function, say you are exploit a function called full, and then you store some, you know, uh, say the RIP, which points to function main. And now you're gonna change this with, you know, you want to overwrite that value to V, you actually don't need to touch the higher part because it's gonna be keep the same anyway. All you need to do is to change the lower part. So it's like to overwrite probably the last two bytes, right? Although I, I show three digits here, but you cannot really change three digits, right? You need to change by bytes. 
So it's like two, like last two fives, three, five, three, eight. You want to overwrite to the value of three, three, one, zero and not touch the rest of the bytes. So it's like you partial overwrite the stack that stores, let's say the RIP, and that will help you to jump to the function weight, the functions that you like. Okay, so this is about pi. I will make sure that you understand this very well uh, because this is gonna be very important to you. Um, any questions? No? Great, okay. Now let's continue. So another mitigation is called ASLR, address space layout of randomization. Um, so the idea is that you know for ASLR, every time that you know something are loaded uh, you know, uh, to the process, the address will be randomized. And that's why if we have a pod, right? If we have high enabled, because of ASLR, the page that is created to store the host, the places will be randomized because of ASLR. And also, not only for that, it's also gonna randomize like stack. And if we have a shell code, like, you know, if we overwrite the saved RIP to the value that falls back to the stack, then ASLR will not be able, because of ASLR, we'll not be able to know where exactly the stack values that we want to go to. But also there's ways that we can bypass ASLR. So if you remember, this is what we have last time, right? We have buffer flow. We know that there is local argument and there is saved RIP, saved, R, uh, saved RBP, and you want to overflow the local argument so that you can overwrite the saved RIP. But now, because you don't know where you, know, you want to jump to, what you could do is that you just find you know, a random, place like the code section that has this particular instruction called jump star RSP. You find the address of that particular instruction. And then by the time that you overwrite the saved RIP, you want to change that value to be the same as the value, the instruction, you know, the address of this instruction. In that case, it means that when the function returns, it will first execute this instruction. And this instruction says, you want to jump RSP, right? And here is RSP, you will jump to where the RSP starts, where the RSP is value goes to. And then we can put our arbitrary shelf, our arbitrary instructions over there so that it will execute whatever we like. All right. So, you know, that is the second mechanism. So that is, you know, you can randomize the address so that there's no way for you to know where the win function is, where the shell code is by the time that you overflow and overwrite the return address, right? And say that you're still smart enough to bypass that, right? You will still be able to execute, you know, somewhere on the stack. Then how you can, still have the system defend against that. And here comes another defense mechanism called WXRX. It means that you could, you can do only one of, you know, these two operations. You could, you could only do either this write or execute. There's no place in the operating system that you can both write and execute. Yes. I would like to point out that that is for current operating systems, but some operating systems that are developed by hobbyists do not have those protections due to the fact that due to the complexity at the time of development, they have not been able to implement said security. Right. Or if you are having like an IoT devices that are relatively old and using like a very antique Linux operating system, you'll also be able to see that access or is not in enabled. So if you, but if you have like the operating, as Tim said, like modern operating systems, such as Ubuntu, or such as the server's operating system, which you're gonna be interact with it frequently, you know, that one already have this actual word enabled. 
So yeah, uh, back to XOR, the content or say, you know, the, the details for, for the specific defense is that, you know, any memory cage is either destructible or executable. That means that if you already have a program, you know, you have those codes over there, there's no way for you, you know, during the runtime that you can change the value of all those instructions. And also similarly, if you have a local variable, which is stored on staff, you can, um, you know, change that, you can add it at that value. But because of this XOR, you know, WXOR X mechanism enabled, you will not be able to execute the program that you write in your local argument. Yes, Tim. What if you map a writing page to a location of memory that a executable page is already at? Uh, Would that bypass the you know, certificate that you'd be writing it in the data page and not the executable page? Uh, if you do that um, uh, memory uh, map, I think it will, so depending on how you do this map, like if you map the entire page, um, then, or if you just like use something like M map, uh, if we're gonna do just M map, it will just follow the uh, destinations um, permission. But if you're gonna just do the entire, like, uh, you know, page mapping like from the operating systems level, then I don't think it's gonna allow you to do that. It will probably just trigger a, a, a mistake. It will trigger an error. Yes. If I remember, if I, I've actually been looking into um, PT. Yes. Because I'm trying to develop an operating system, ironically enough. Um, and as far as I can tell, there's no actual protections against two pages, separate pages being mapped, mapped to different virtual addresses, but having the same physical address point. There's no protection to stop that. Uh, for, right, for physical address, right, yeah. because those those happens on the hardware, like those happens from the place that you map physical address to virtual address. Yes, and that's what I'm saying. If you have a different set of virtual addresses that are mapped to a physical address that has that code that you want to overwrite. I see what you're saying. I see. Would see. that bypass the no execute? Because it's yeah. not going to the virtual address that has that right protection. That's a great question. Yes, I think that will bypass. That will bypass this. But then I, I think that by the time that you go like higher level, because you are going to have, I don't think I'm not sure if the operating system will allow you to have two virtual address that maps to the. Yeah, actually, you can map two virtual address to the same. Physical. Yes, you can do that. But then for this virtual address itself, because it's also memory page, right? So you will be, you still need to set this either executable or write. But I agree with you. Like if you have two virtual address and then one is write, so you can say you have one process and then have this virtual address and you access this physical address and then do write, right? And then you have another uh, process and also use this virtual address to access that and to execute, then it will probably trigger it. Like it will kind of bypass this WX or X. Oh yeah, because the uh, dirty face. Exactly. Right. Yes. Cool. I forgot about that particular thing. Yep. Okay, but there is also, you know, a relatively easier way because for you, like for the thing that Tim just mentioned, as users, if you're going to be on users' level, it's going to be very hard for you to predict or to control to have like two process. And making sure that there are two virtual memories exactly pointing to the right physical address. Um, so instead of doing that, um, you can have a relatively easier way to bypass WXOR, which is called ROC, and that is for level eight. So that is for our you know, challenge level eight. Uh, I'm not going to talk about ROC today, uh, but you could Google that. It is also called return to Lixi. So the high level idea is that, you know, if there is no win function, uh, we have to come up with those instructions by ourselves, right? And then we could store those information on the stack. But if the stack is no longer executable, then we want to find those executable pieces from code. And guess 
where is the code, you know, where is the part of the program that will have a lot of code? libc. This, you know, libc is a huge library that contains many, many codes. So we're going to choose and pick those code snippet from libc and then connect them together. You link them together so that your program, by the time that you overwrite, you know, the return address, it will be able to jump to the libc, execute part of, you know, your, your task, return it back, and then jump to the next libc places, continue to execute part of your, you know, task. And then you do that like jump by jump, we call it gadgets. So each small gadget, we just connect those gadgets together. And then in the end, you will be able to accomplish this entire task. So this is a high level idea for return of a return oriented program in Rock. Um, you could just search online and then you should be able to get some, you know, uh, information. Um, or you can also just check my videos for uh, software security uh, 545. I have videos that talks about how Rob and how Return to VC works, how to find those nice gadgets. I have demos for that as well. So if you're interested in go there and check it out, you should be able to learn Rob by yourself. Okay, so those we have been talking a lot about Stack Overflow vulnerabilities. We have been talking a lot about, okay, what are the existing mechanisms that can stop us uh, from attacking it? Uh, but also we want to know if you're going to become a software developer in the future, if you're going to write the code by yourself, how are you going to stop all those bad things happening? How are you going to just like do this proactively? Do not contain a vulnerability in your code. So there are some tips for you to make your uh, program more secure. But also, I want to know that this doesn't guarantee that you will know you will not have you know stack overflow or any kind of overflow for sure. But those are just like nice um, suggestions that will uh, give you higher like you know just make your program more secure. But you may still suffer you know just based on the other designs part of your program. Anyway, so for those functions, something that you want to. Uh, um, like pay attention is that when you do stream manipulation or memory copy, like memory manipulation, you want to make sure that you always give the destination a fixed length. So, because if your destination, if your destination memory has a specific length, which you always do, you know, if uh, no matter if you're using a stack or heap. You always have, you know, a maximum length, a maximum chunk of the memory for um, for the destination. So please make sure that first you know, you know what is the maximum length, and then you want to use those more secure functions where you can specify the max number of the bytes that you're gonna copy to the destination. So for example, for string copy. You know, the two arguments are destination and source, and we just call string copy destination and source. And without any careful check, you will be able, you may have, you know, a source that has longer bytes, has more bytes than the destination's location. And in that case, it will overflow your destination for sure, right? However, if you use stir in copy, where you can't specify the maximum number of bytes copied into the destination, then you can, you know, add that cap there. So that even though that the source string or the source, you know, array has more bytes than the destinations, it will not overflow it because it will stop at this, you know, specified max bytes. And similarly, you know, for stir cat, when you do a string catenation, you want to make sure that you have this you know cap over there to you know make sure that your destination will not be overflowed and also gas you want to have f gas where you can specify the size and for s per nav also you want to specify the size using s and per nav and of course this doesn't mean that you can you know specify the size part you also want to make sure that when you write this program you understand the destination you know exactly 
the size of the destinations array so that you can specify the size correctly. Otherwise, you will still overflow it. Okay, and then also for man copy. Oops, sorry. For man copy, usually, you know, um, um, we don't pay attention to this like size. There is a size argument in man copy actually. So when you use man copy, you want to specify the size argument. Um, also, in bytes specifically. Yes, in bytes specifically. And you want to check the source argument site. Um, that is something that uh, you know uh, we have shown for many times. If the source argument, um, you know, if the source array has more bytes than the destination, that will overflow. Um, and if there's no way for you to use stir and copy, say that you know you you're maybe dealing with some legacy code or you're dealing with you know some legacy operating system that don't even have stir and copy. That you will still have to use the and copy. And then in that case, you want to check your source argument size. So you could just add any condition before you call start and uh, before you call start copy and the check, okay, if the source is smaller than the size, the length of the destination, then you use a start and copy. You just continue to execute. Yes. Another thing that I just uh, thought of about the copy as a possible security issue. Is depending on how the um, free memory is structured, how they actually store what memory is used in that, and you're using memcopy in that area, mm -hmm. there is a chance that if you use room the size argument, you might overwrite some of those headers that detail um, allocated memory. Uh, you're talking about heap. Yes. Right. And that is uh, heap overflow. That is what you just said is exactly heap overflow. Basically, you know, for heap, it stores those metadata along with those data, right? Like, you know, if you have uh, T cache, uh, it will store the information of, okay, where's the next T cache location? Or if it stores, uh, you know, the other beans, it will source those information. And you're right, because of, you know, this kind of overflow, it will change the metadata. And then you can manipulate the value that you can, you know, change the metadata and making miss let's say misleading the uh, heap manager to thought that the metadata has been changed in some way and then you can use that as a feature to you know overwrite the or to change the other parts of the location or even you can trigger you know some like arbitrary read and write or even arbitrary execution and i'm great that i'm glad that you have thought about this um check uh, my YouTube video for keep operation. It has a lot of details about this. And also you can check um, there, it just search that how to heap, uh, how and the two is the like number two, how to heap. Heap is uh, you know, a heap, H-E-A-P. And there is a, uh, um, uh, a Git repository talking about all different kinds of a heap, possible heap manipulation and heap uh, attacks. And what you just said is one of them. Cool. And also, by the way, guys, if you know if you feel interested in those kind of like software stuff, I highly encourage you to you know attend like software security classes, like more advanced. Uh, like there is a class called four eight four sixty six. It's operating system. It will touch something about heap. It will touch more things about operating system though. Um, and also there is five forty five. It's software security. You will see a lot of more details about those, and that is very interesting. All right. So, okay. Um, so that is about uh, you know our possible defense, and then in terms as for um, security check for binary, because we now know that there are operating system already give us a lot of like nice features that can help us defend, and because of that, if we're going to attack a program you will um, need to uh, make sure what security defense mechanism has been turned on and what has been uh, you know, turned off. And you could use this command called check set. It will give you this information about the binaries, like maybe the challenge you know, that you're looking at. So if you use check set, um, you will be able 
to see that, okay, the architecture, you know, whether or not it is uh, relocatable. Uh, and you can check, okay, if the canary is there for that, if NX means, um, you know, uh, it's uh, WX or, uh, sorry, it's WX or X. So NX means that there's no, you don't want to, you know, exit, you don't want to overwrite the exit for the place or you don't want to execute the uh, written place. So NX is for that. Um, and then PI, as we already said, so you can just check this three specific items, that canary, pi, and also NX. So for example, if you um, run check stack with uh, slash v slash ls, you'll be able to see that, you know, for that particular binary already enabled all those security checks, that's that canary, NX, and pi. All right. Um, and another thing is that, sorry, yes. Sorry, I, I, I can't hear the question again. Okay, can I repeat, can I repeat what I just said about NX? Yes, NX is just like an alias for W, X, or X. So you should just treat this two equivalent. It means that you want to have a page or a memory page that can only be either writable or executable. Okay, um, and you may notice, you may notice that if you have a program and then you just like use GCC, you know, whatever compiler to compile this program, you may not just get the program that are similar to what I have just shown you last time for those challenges. And that is a big cost. I disabled a lot of security features when I compile those programs. And here I am just giving you those commands that I use when I compile those programs. You know, if you want to try to come up with a vulnerable program by yourself, you just have fun with it. You can turn off stack canary by, you know, specifying by the time that you compile it, specifying that you do not want any stack protection. So by default, if you just do GCC, uh, something that C, it will automatically have stack protected enabled for the modern GCC's uh, you know, compiler, those like modern versions. But if you want to turn it off, you could specify this, this flag, a dash F, no, dash stack, dash protected. And similarly, um, if you want to disable WX or X on stack, then you can use GCC dash D exec stack to enable that. That means that in this case, that your uh, compiler um, will, you know, allow you to put something on the stack. And then the third is about LSLR. So LSR is an operating system, it's operating system level, uh, you know, randomization for page for those memories. Um, you need to change the Linux operating system uh, using this specific command. So it is like enter like slash hop slash uh, sys slash kernel slash randomize the VA space. Like VA here is a virtual address. So you want to randomize the v virtual address space. The default value is two means that you're gonna you know randomize that. And they have also like different kind of random degree like uh, to what granularity that you want to randomize that. But if you change that um, file's value to zero, that means that you disable it. And uh, uh, be reminded that, you know, the operating system is, is based, is file-based. So in this case, if you change those files name, uh, sorry, you change this file's content, then you are configuring your operating system. And then last but not least, if you want to disable Pi. So just like, you know, those programs that you interact with last time, um, I compile it with dash no dash hack. So in that case, you will be able to get, you know, um, you know, like those three functions with the absolute address instead of the offset. 
All right, that's everything about software security. Uh, we have like a 15, 10 to 15 minutes left. Uh, and I want to keep it open. Uh, you know, any question is welcome. So this is gonna be the last lecture for Stack Overflow and also for our class. So I would like to keep it open and talk with you guys to see, you know, what you think about this class. And also, of course, if you have any questions about the lectures about especially for software security, since we're gonna do the assignment very quickly, also let me know. Okay. All right, and then now I'm gonna stop recording.